Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you a true story from the life of Sir Winston Churchill on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Edward Arnold. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight is a very special occasion indeed, for with the Prime Minister's kind permission, it is our pleasure and privilege to present a true story from the life of surely the world's greatest living statesman, Sir Winston Churchill. It's an amazing and exciting adventure, and we've transcribed it from Sir Winston's own cable reports sent when he was a newspaper correspondent during the Boer War. And now, here is Frank Goss. Here's a timely reminder for the days ahead. Is someone you know going to be married soon, or perhaps a couple you know have just announced their engagement? In either case, a gracious way to make their happy days even happier is to send a Hallmark card. You'll find special Hallmark cards for both engagements and weddings. Cards that are so lovely the bride will want to keep them in her wedding book. And each card will carry an added compliment on the back. The Hallmark and Crown. The symbol you look for when you care enough to send the very best. And now Edward Arnold brings you our true story from the life of Sir Winston Churchill on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. It was the end of the 19th century and there was a war. It had broken out between the Dutch and the British over territories in South Africa, then known as the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. They called it the Boer War. As wars go, it was minor, but the ferocity of the fighting made up for what it might have lacked in scope. It was here then in November of 1899 that two men were talking in an army tent. One was a British army officer, Captain Haldane. The other, a special correspondent for the London Morning Post, sent to Africa to cover the war. His name was Winston Churchill. How'd you like to take a train trip, Churchill? Oh, love it. Where? Boer country. You pulling my leg? No, not at all. Here, have a look at this. Yeah, I've got orders to do some reconnaissance. Take the armored train. It sounds like fun. A bit risky, isn't it? Huh. How old are you, Churchill? Twenty-five, but... Oh, then you're silly mortal. Oh, it's old men like me that have to worry about risks. You want to come along? You might run into something good to send back to your readers. It might be interesting. But I thought the boss would have cut the line by this time. Oh, if we'd give them the chance, they would. That's why we buzz out there every now and again. Well, six in the morning, ready to board? Hmm? Right. We were a force of 120 men. Our armoured train was made up of five wagons, an engine in the middle, and an old seven-pound muzzle-loading gun. That morning, November the 15th, we left the camp and rolled noisily over the African plain. Haldane and I were in the cab of the engine. I don't like it, Churchill. Too quiet. Oh, I shouldn't worry, sir. The boars are about somewhere. They'd have to be stone deaf not to have heard us by now. Well, I'd hate to run into any force of them at this point. They make a better target than a scouting party. Why the devil couldn't headquarters give us something better than that ruddy little pop gun? England expects every man to do his duty, <laughs> with or without pop guns. Oh, well, that's all very well for you. Not your job. But I can tell no, you... The uh, enemy sighted ahead. Uh, where, Barnes? Uh, on the hill, sir. That one about 600 to the right of the railway lines. Oh. Uh, hand me the glasses, will you? Thank you. What do you think, sir? Oh, well, have a look for yourself. Might be a scouting party. Might be more. Mm. Hard to say. There's enough cover up there to hide a fair number. Field guns, too, for that matter. Come on, stand to the men and the gun crew. Yes, sir. Uh, engineer. Yes, sir. Slow down a bit. Yes, sir. There are horsemen further along. Yes, I can see them. I don't like the looks of it. Engineer, reverse. We're going back. Right, sir. Yes, 
drawn in. Get down, sir. Not bloody likely. This is what I came out to report. You're on a picture if you don't look out. Now, what the devil's that? A wagon derailed from the looks of it, sir. Get your head back in here. Ow. Yep. Give me a hand with it. Yeah. I'm all right, sir. Shoulder, I think. We'll have to get a crew out to clear the lines. Let me give him a hand. You stay here. Don't be long. We worked for more than an hour under heavy fire. And then the couplings broke and the order was given to abandon the train. Our losses were heavy. The engine loaded with wounded got away, but the rest of us were taken prisoner. We were sent to Pretoria, where the officers and I were confined in the state's model school in the center of the town. And that, for the moment, seemed to put an end to my budding career as a war correspondent. A month passed. Last. Hello. Oh, hello, Barnes. Sit down. <laughs> have you read the latest? The Birkstern has a beauty today. Our troops have been slaughtered and put to flight. According to this, we're done for. You wouldn't be surprised if the ruddy Boers invaded England next. Oh, head up. No wonder some of the chaps are giving up. Read enough of that literary garbage and you're bound to imagine all sorts of things happening outside. There's not much we can do. Look here. Pull your chair closer. I've been thinking. Escape? Again. Well, keep your voice down. Now listen. We might be able to do it. How? You know we can't bribe the sentries. That's been tried. Besides, nobody's got enough money to really make it worth their while. That's no good, I know, but I've done a rough sketch. Here. It's a plan of the prison. Now, you see here? Mm -hmm. This is where we are. Mm -hmm. On two sides around us is an iron grill. Mm -hmm. On the other two sides, a corrugated fence about ten feet high, right? Yes, yes, but the sentries are inside the walls, 40 or 50 yards apart. How do you get by them? Here. Exactly here. The eastern wall. Yeah. I've watched. There's a point where they can't see the top of a few yards of the wall. The electric lights in the middle of the quadrangle glare in their eyes. That section of the wall would be completely dark to them. You think it would? But suppose it isn't. Well, we'd have to wait until they turn their backs, then. Double safety measure, if you like. What about getting from here to the wall? Oh, we can do that, I'm sure. Mm, so, we, we get over the wall. Then what? We'd be in the garden of the villa next door. And after that, get out of the garden, through the town, stay away from the patrols. The place is crawling with them, from what I've heard. Exactly. And after that, 280-odd miles to the Portuguese-Africa frontier. My dear Churchill, you're balmy. Want to try it with me? When? Oh, I don't know. What's the date today? December 10th. Nice to get back to our side in time for Christmas. How about tomorrow night? It's idiotic. Staying here's more so. Yes. Yes, I suppose it is, isn't it? All right, what's the odds? Good. Seven o'clock. When they ring the dinner bell, we'll try it then. The next day passed slowly, and then it grew dark. The bell for dinner rang, and the officers went to the mess hall, except for Lieutenant Barnes and I. We stayed where we were, watching, waiting for the chance. I thought you said they walked up and down. They do. What's that sentry doing? He's been there for over an hour, has moved. That's our spot on the wall to get over. He will, they always have. I wish he'd get a move on my legs, I've gone to sleep. Hello, here comes his pal. Perhaps now they... <laughs> you call that sentry duty? If they were in my troop, I'd give them what for. Look at them, jabbering away like a couple of old cows. We'll get a chance in a minute. Yeah, we better, or somebody's going to wonder where we are. We'll give them a few more minutes. We gave them another hour, and then the chance was gone. We had to give up for the night. Then it was Tuesday, the 12th. Another day of fear, waiting. But fear crystallizing more and more into desperation. Anything was better now than further suspense. Once again, it was night. Again, the dinner bell sounded. This time, Barnes and I had hidden in an office closer to the eastern wall and closer to the path of the sentries. For half an hour, we watched. The guards marched back and forth, passing, repassing. When it's time, I'll go first. It's safer one at a time. As soon as I'm over the wall, make a run for it yourself. Right. I'll wait on the other side. Give a soft whistle. Uh, it's cold tonight, huh? Yeah. I wouldn't mind a pipe full. Nor I. They turned their backs. 
Going to try? I yes. Good luck. Good luck. Tomorrow. I'll see you on the other side. Not until Thursday. Uh, uh. How's your girl? Uh, she's taken up with a shrine of a thousand. What chance do I have? Bad luck. Always the way. Uh, there. Did you... Did you hear something? No. Did you? No. I suppose not. It's just cold. Uh, we better start walking. That shrine of a sergeant will probably cancel our leave if he sees us talking again. Huh? Yeah. What a shrine. I had one parting glimpse of the sentries as they walked away. Then I dropped into the adjoining garden and crouched among the shrubs. It now remained to wait for Barnes. The first step had been taken. I was beyond the wall. In just a moment, we'll bring you the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Many of us, even those of us who feel we have very modern tastes, like a touch of the old-fashioned. Or maybe we prefer antique furniture, or like to eat by candlelight, or enjoy listening to songs of the good old days. And many of us, too, love the old-fashioned valentines covered with lace and hearts and pretty flowers. Well, you'll be happy to know that among the many, many new Hallmark valentines now on display at the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards... There's a new collection of beautiful, old-fashioned valentines. Each of these fascinating valentines reflects the charm and courtliness of the yesterdays when grandmother was a girl. You'll find that some of these lovely lacy cards have special messages just for that one special valentine in your life. A wife, husband, mother, or sweetheart, or special friend. These messages put into just the right words the feelings you have in your heart for that number one valentine. Yes, the Hallmark artists and writers have recaptured the charm and beauty of the Valentines of yesteryear and created Valentines that are even lovelier than the ones Grandmother still has in that trunk up in the attic. And each of these Hallmark Valentines has an added distinction, an added compliment for the receiver, the Hallmark and crown on the back, the symbol you look for when you care enough to send the very best. And now Edward Arnold brings you the second act of our true story from the life of Sir Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill had taken his first step to freedom. He was beyond the prison wall. He stayed where he was, waiting for Barnes to join him. Ten minutes, twenty, thirty, an hour. And then he heard steps on the prison side of the wall and voices, English voices. One belonged to Barnes. They were loud and appeared to be purposely so. I must leave you, so it breaks my heart to go. Something tells me I am needed at the front. Churchill, Churchill, it's all up. The sentry suspects something. I couldn't get out. I've got some of the chaps with me to try and make them think everything's all right. You know, late evening stroll and all that. Can you get back in again? Not an earthly. I'll go on alone. Don't chance it. Sorry, too late now. Well, be careful. I'm afraid the alarm will be out soon. We'll try to divert them. All right. Thanks. Good luck. Churchill got up, put on his hat, and moved through the garden gate into the road. He passed a sentry no more than five yards away, and the man didn't give him a second glance. Winston Churchill was at large in Pretoria. He walked leisurely through the night toward the suburbs, and as he later wrote in his dispatch to London... Well, how did I stand? In the heart of enemy country. I didn't know a soul to whom I could go for help. Nearly 300 miles to Delagoa Bay. And they'd be out looking for me before dawn, if they were not already at it. I had 75 shillings in my pocket and four slabs of chocolate. I couldn't speak a word of Dutch or Kaffir, and had no map or compass, worse luck. Barnes had those. It had got to be the railway. But which one? Which was the right one? 
I remembered a line about half a mile from there. Was it the Delagoa Bay or the Petersburg branch? Oh, I suppose one way to find out was to catch a train running east. That was the idea. Eastbound. When Churchill reached the rail lines, he found that they ran north. But since it was winding in and about through the hills, he decided to follow it anyway. After walking for an hour, two hours, he heard the whistle and rumble of an approaching train. It was slowing down for a way station. He crouched low by the side of the track. I swung onto the train. It was a goods train, and the wagons were loaded with sacks. Soft sacks covered with coal dust. I managed to burrow down into them and slept. Just before dawn, I left the moving train to look for a suitable hiding place until dark. My plan was to board another train when night came again. I found myself in the middle of a wide valley surrounded by low hills. My immediate need was water. My thirst was almost unbearable. I moved along the railway line, then found what appeared to be the entrance to a mine, a perfect place to remain until dark. I hoped there would be an underground stream somewhere in its depth. Hold on there. What? Don't move, I'll shoot. I, I, I was searching for water. Who are you? I'm, I, I'm with a commando unit. I, that, that is, I, I fell off the train just now. Needed water. Never mind that. You're British, aren't you? Yes. You realize I could kill you. That this is Boer country and this is a Boer mine. Yes. <laughs> Wait a minute. I've seen a picture of you. You, you, you are the man, the, the newspaper correspondent who has escaped from Pretoria. Churchill. Afraid so. <laughs> There's a reward for you, my friend. Look here. I'd be obliged if you'd let me have some food and water first. Then you can do what you want. Did you really expect to be able to travel through Boer country and get out? I'm going to try. Mm. All right. Follow me quickly. I'll give you water and food. Oh, by the way, my name is Stevens. British, myself. But what are you doing here? Running the mine for the Boers, and incidentally getting out as much military information to our side as I can. It's incredible. <clears throat> They've given me a servant woman to take care of my dig. She's a devil of a good housekeeper, but all bore. If she gets wind of you here, we're... Well, we'll both be for it. Where is she now? In the town, buying supplies. I'll have to keep you hidden until you can go on to the border. Go on. Have some more. I <laughs> couldn't. I say, you better. It's not going to be easy smuggling food to you. The girl's a tyrant when it comes to food. No, countries at war, waste not, want not, you know. She cooks just so much and no more. Well, she thinks I eat too much anyway. Go on, tuck in. How long have you been out here? Oh, ages. Sometimes I think I'll never see home again. Mm. How's the war going? According to the Boers, they've won already. Nonsense. They're losing and they know it. But they're not ready to give in yet. Look here, this isn't fair to you, putting me up. It's not your job. Oh, what the devil. I'd like to see you get away. We can both thumb our noses at them. I say, but one thing. Mm -hmm. Keep it quiet. Don't mention my name or anything about this. I may have to be working here for some time. Right, you are. Well, if you're finished, we'd better get you tucked away. Meanwhile, I'll find out what I can about trains going to the border. <laughs> For five days, he kept me concealed from the owners of the mine, the operators and all the Boers around us. Meanwhile, at the prison, the news of my escape had been released. Lieutenant Barnes kept his fellow officers informed of as much as he knew of my progress. I don't know how he's done it. They've sent telegrams all up and down the railway with his description, printed 3,000 photographs. And the paper today said he escaped disguised as a woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nothing. I heard one of the sentries saying he'd been captured at Komatipur, dressed as a Transvaal policeman. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told me he'd been caught in Brooksburg. Well, 
What do you think, Barnes? Has Churchill got away? Well, as, as long as the rumors keep going and he's being captured in half a dozen different places at once, I'd say the chances are he's still free. Well, I don't think he's got a chance. But what a great thing if he did succeed. Well, from the way the papers are playing it up, you'd think... You'd think he was the prime minister or something. <laughs> They're giving it more space than the bloody war. <laughs> On the sixth day, Winston Churchill's patient wait was rewarded. He found a convenient train standing in a siding. It was labeled to Lorenko Marquis. And as she pulled out, he climbed aboard, once again hiding amidst the holes and crevices of some large sacks. The heat was stifling. There he stayed for two and a half days, more dead than alive. At the border, the train stopped. Then with a lurch, it pulled out again. And at last, it reached its destination. Delagoa Bay. Yes? Oh, I'd like to see the British consul, please. Hmm? What do you want with him? Will you tell him Winston Churchill would like to speak to him? Uh, Winston, you are Churchill? Why, I, I thought you I were don't that. imagine I look very prepossessing. I've had rather a long and tiresome journey. Do you mind if I come in? Uh, I have an idea some Boer agents might have spotted me. I'd rather not be caught by them again. The rest of the story can best be told in the words Winston Churchill, foreign correspondent, cabled to his newspaper dated December the 22nd, 1899. As soon as the news of my arrival spread about the town, I received many offers of assistance from the English residents. Unless any of the Boer agents with whom Lorenko Marcus is infested should attempt to recapture me in neutral territory, nearly a dozen gentlemen escorted me to the steamer armed with revolvers. It is from the cabin of this little vessel as she coasts along the sandy shores of Africa that I write the concluding lines of this letter. And the reader who may persevere through this hurried account will perhaps understand why I write them with a feeling of triumph. And better than triumph. A feeling of pure joy. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the story you have just heard actually happened. Is it any wonder, then, that a young man of this remarkable courage and resourcefulness should go on to become not only his nation's greatest leader, but a world-renowned statesman? Any wonder, too, that he led Great Britain through its gravest crises during World War II? The Prime Minister made many inspiring speeches during those grim days, but we especially treasure Sir Winston's words you are about to hear, for it seems to us that the truth they contain might well have been learned by a younger Winston Churchill as a 25-year-old correspondent during the Boer War. Put your confidence in us. Give us your faith and your blessing. And under providence, all will be well. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Neither the sudden shock of battle nor the long-drawn trials of vigilance and exertion will wear us down. Give us the tools, and we will finish the job. And now, here is Frank Goss. Earlier, we were talking about the charming old-fashioned Hallmark Valentines. Well, believe me, there's also a host of other Hallmark Valentines that are newer than tomorrow. Delightful, humorous Valentines that will bring a smile of pleasure on Valentine's Day. There's one, for instance, that has little colored ribbons on it, and it asks, will you be my valentine? If you need some time to think, send me back this bow of pink. If you kind of think you might, send me back this bow of white. And each of the other bows conveys a different answer. 
This is just one example of the added originality that's something extra you'll find in Hallmark Valentines. Some of these Valentines have a storybook effect with little cutout scenes that come into place as you turn the pages. Others seem to come to life amusingly. There's a big white rabbit who actually rolls his eyes in answer to the questions of, do I want you for my Valentine? And you'll find warmly humorous Hallmark Valentines for everyone on your Valentine list. Gay Valentines that'll bring a grin to a four-year-old. Others to tickle the funny bone of a grandfather. And like all Hallmark cards, you can be sure these humorous Valentines will be in the best of taste. For each has the sign of good taste on the back. The Hallmark and Crown. The symbol you look for when you care enough to send the very best. And now, here's Mr. Arnold. I'm sure those humorous Hallmark Valentines are going to be spreading a lot of smiles and cheer on February the 14th, Frank. And one thing all of us can always use is another smile. You know, Mark Twain once said, wrinkles should merely indicate where smiles have been. Incidentally, I think you'll be interested to know that the part of Sir Winston Churchill tonight was played by Gary Montgomery, the young actor-nephew of famed Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery. Thank you so much... Thank you so much, Gary, for a splendid performance. Well, today we paid tribute to Winston Churchill. And next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, we'll salute another remarkable man who made a deep imprint on this world of ours. We're going to reveal a fascinating chapter in the life of Dr. Sigmund Freud, starring Mr. Lou Ayers. And on February the 13th, you will hear another exciting detective story about the master French criminologist, Alphonse Bertillon starring Mr. Charles Boyer. Won't you join us for these exciting programs? So until next week, this is Edward Arnold saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. The Hallmark Hall of Fame is produced and directed by William Froome. Tonight's transcribed script by Anthony Ellis. Featured in tonight's cast were Gary Montgomery, Ben Wright, Richard Peel, Jack Moyles, Polly Bear, and Jane Novello. The Hallmark Hall of Fame on television next week will present an incident from the life of one of America's great patriots, Patrick Henry. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you until next week at the same time when you hear a true story from the life of Dr. Sigmund Freud, starring Mr. Lou Ayers on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Have you ever wished you could talk to just one or two individuals who live behind the Iron Curtain, talk to them on an individual basis, tell them the truth about our country, its freedom, and its ideals? Well, that's exactly what the two radio systems supported by the Crusade for Freedom do. Over Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia, the people behind the Iron Curtain hear the voices of their own countrymen, the voices of individual citizens who have escaped to the free world and who tell them the truth. You, too, can help on an individual basis by contributing money to build more stations, more transmitters. Send your contribution to Crusade for Freedom, care of your local postmaster. Send it today. This is the CBS Radio Network.